We need to take the whole line back to formula. Back to formula? Stellaris Developer Diary 316 has just dropped. And we're now going to look at what is coming to leaders because ladies and gentlemen, they are changing yet again. We've had the leader rebalance, we've had the leader rework, we've had the leader re-rebalance. Now we are getting the leader consolidation. Stick around to find out how the general class is completely dead, governors are gone, but also more with us than ever before, and how we are going to be getting a brand new role for envoys in the galactic community and in our federations, as well as a brand new minister and a rebalance to the early council for biological empires, that's the minister of state, and even more, along with some of my own ramblings on leader balance right at the end. So stick around for all of that and more, ladies and gentlemen, and let's dive in. Oh, make sure you're sitting comfortably and you have some snacks because this is going to be quite a long one. The main thing we are going to hear about today is a likely 3.10 feature. This is a number of changes that the devs are calling leader consolidation. With leaders becoming more important to your empire following the 3.8 Gemini release alongside galactic paragons, there were some rough edges left over and experiences that could be better. Some of the changes that the devs are implementing during this leader consolidation were talked about during the development of galactic paragons but decided against for various reasons or out of scope at the time while others are based on data gathered since then and community feedback. I'm going to circle back to some of what was said here later on at the end, but first let's dive in straight away to these coming changes. First off, the devs have noted that some of these names are still being argued over and they could all be subject to change. Hate one of the names in particular, please let them know either in the comments below or go to the forums. The forum is probably the better place to go because actually one of the devs probably hates it too and give them some suggestions. That's what they're asking for here. So first off, admirals and generals are going to be merged into a single commander class, the military leader class. Admirals and generals will remain as individual veteran classes with the following focuses. Admirals will focus on fleets and general naval combat. Generals, which is going to be two of the now four veteran classes, will focus on taking planets and assaulting static defenses. Armies, planetary bombardment, ground combat, and attacking defensive structures such as star bases are the general's forte. Which basically, I believe, Except for that bit about attacking star bases, the bonuses there could be very tasty. I believe this class is pretty much not going to get used because at the moment general is the most underused class because you don't really need these bonuses to armies, planetary bombardment, ground combat, etc. There will be the commissioner veteran class that will focus on planetary governance and in brackets here, martial law. That's a very interesting thing to have written down here. We'll find out more about that later, but for now, martial law based on a class? Wow, okay. Then finally, we'll have a strategist class, which I think is basically the same as we have now on admirals, which will focus on the council, especially the minister of defense position. Overall, I think this change somewhat makes sense. We've removed basically two of the Admiral Veteran classes and combined them, I think, into the Admiral Veteran class here for commanders. We've taken most of what generals do except the spying stuff and we put that into the general class, it looks like. The commissioner seems to be taking things from governor, maybe i'm a bit unsure about that and finally strategist is probably just a carryover of most of the bonuses we now have like fleet uh, logistician armada commander all of those kinds of things that give a an empire wide bonus rather than being a fleet specific bonus this consolidation makes perfect sense to me i don't really see anything wrong with it except possibly why didn't we do it before the old governors and some envoys will now function as a merged official class. This will be the administrative leader class. And if you're enjoying this video, please officiate that like button. 
the four veteran classes here. And actually, before I dive into those, I want to briefly mention where we currently are, just for some context. I realized I didn't do that before. We have now got four leader types. They are admirals, governors, generals, and scientists. Each leader type has three different veteran classes you unlock when you hit level four, assuming you have galactic paragons. Now we're removing, it seems, one of those leader types entirely, one of those classes entirely, and we therefore get an extra veteran class added on to each of the remaining three. So there will still be the same number of veteran classes in total, but one fewer leader classes. All right. The veteran classes for officials will be delegates. That will focus on federations and the galactic community which basically now means envoys will be actual leaders that have actual impact on our empire. We might finally care if one of our envoys is assassinated. That's actually a really, really nice change. It's very thematic. It's something a lot of us have wanted for a long time. Why have envoys in the game? Why represent them as leader adjacent if they simply don't matter? They have names, they have ages. Now they have actual purpose. There will also be industrialists. This will be a planetary governance style leader. Industry and development will be the main focus here. So this is probably a straight rollover from the similar industrial style class, veteran class we have at the moment. You'll be getting your forge focus, possibly also getting your researcher focus. Maybe not though, we'll have to see later from this veteran class. Next up, we have Ambassador. This is going to be a council focus. That is diplomacy, espionage, and first contact. A lot of these things at the moment are shared between generals, and I believe governors have these classes, uh, these, these traits right now that you can pick. It's all probably going to be consolidated into Ambassador. This will be especially suited for the new Minister of State position. Hold on a minute. They are adding in an entire new position into the council. That could mean we are now getting three starting positions, one per leader class, because we're getting three classes now from the four, which does mean from the start of the game, regular bio empires won't have as much of a mismatch between their agenda completion times and Gestalt empires that start with a leader, a commander, a ruler, and four nodes, which is effectively five councillors in total. Bio is now going to start with four councillors, which should very much even the playing field, though possibly later on, you're now going to be able to get a total of seven councillors, which could be pretty wild. Finally, there will be the advisor uh, official focus, which is a council focus again, but unlike the uh, the ambassador focus, this will be focused mainly on the economy. So this is probably the old uh, governor councillor focus roles, which had things like uh, the investor, things that were empire wide bonuses to trade, building cost reductions, that sort of thing will probably be now in this advisor veteran class. This does give the officials two council focus subclasses, but the two are different enough that the devs felt it best to let them specialize accordingly. The advisor is expected to thrive in some civic-based council positions. Very interesting stuff. Overall, I'm really glad that we got to have um, actual envoy leader classes. That's awesome. But I'm a little concerned they're taking away from the governor class. Basically, you'll see that when we get on to the next new class, the third and final class, governors are pretty much gone all together in some ways. In other ways, they're more here than they've ever been, but well, let's find out now. The final class is now, and as in the past, the scientist class. This will remain the third leader class. The four veteran classes here are going to be explorer, which will focus on surveying and exploration. Given the game balance we have so far, honestly, I don't see people really picking that as a veteran class ever. You have to get to level four in your leader before you can even pick this, let's not forget, which won't be very early on in the game. So by the time you get there and start leveling up, let's say you have an explorer leader, putting them into five, six, and seven, getting some bonuses, you'll probably have explored the entire galaxy, thus making most of the bonuses they get pretty useless. 
I think that the bonuses from Explorer should possibly be in the first levels, levels one to four of your scientist leaders. Although that could be annoying later on if you want to specialize your scientists into being council focused or having nothing to do with exploration once the exploration phase of the game is over. It just still does kind of feel like a dead class. Next up we have the academic. They will focus on archaeology and anomalies. This is still useful, though suffers similar problems, I believe, to the Explorer veteran class. Once you've completed all of your archaeological sites, and once you've surveyed your anomalies by the mid-game, you've got nothing left for your academics to do, making their existence, somewhat ironically, academic. Then we have the Analyst class. This will focus on planetary governance and assisting research. This is very interesting. This, I believe, means possibly that we are going to be losing the assist research feature or option for our scientists. Why do I say that? Well, let's, let's find out in just a moment. Hold that thought. Next up and finally, we have the statistician. They will focus on the council, especially the minister of science position. This will be your council traits, things like genius, things like um, the plus one, I forget what it's called, but plus one research alternatives, your specific scientist focuses, all of that kind of stuff is probably going to be rolled into this statistician class. Right, let's talk about planetary governance. Some of you may have put two and two together now and hopefully made four, as was suggested in last week's teaser and by some of what we've just gone through and by what I've said previously in this video, the governor will no longer be a leader class. Instead, any planet or sector can be governed by any leader regardless of class with differing effects. First off, I'm sad that governors are gone. F to pay respects down in the comments to governors. Long have they reigned in Stellaris, but after seven years, their light has dimmed. Kind of, in another regard, governors are now bigger and better than ever before because every class is a governor class in some ways. Depends on how you look at this. Right, so instead of being a local planetary decision, if you place, for example, a commander in charge of a sector, that will put the entire sector under martial law. For those of you that don't know at the moment, martial law is a planetary decision that grants you additional stability from soldier jobs, you get additional soldier jobs, you reduce growth massively and get a massive reduction to resource output. Basically, you turn your colonies into defensive worlds if you don't have any enforcers or soldier jobs on the planet, this can be a good way of quickly adding some armies to defend against a hostile encroaching force, though it isn't generally recommended for most of your playthroughs. The exact effects of martial law are going to be changing as well. The devs haven't told us what that will be, but it won't be exactly the same as what we've known previously. They wanted to be a reasonable thing to put the military in charge of, for example, a newly conquered or disruptive set of planets until the condition stabilizes. So it may not be as uh, punitive on your resource output. It might not add as many soldier jobs. It might be more about now military control in order to uh, keep a sector from rebelling or maybe just a planet. I'm definitely in favor of that. That sounds like a very fun and thematic change and may make martial law more important than it has been in the past. I think a lot of players might have not even known it existed down there in the planetary decisions tree. Administrative leaders will have most of the effects of the current governors and the assist research effects will be moving to scientific governors. So anything that was in the assist research veteran class that we currently had is now going to be based on having a scientist directly on the planet. So I'm pretty sure assist research as a science ship effect will be gone. Overall, I think I am tentatively in favor of these changes, but I haven't tried them. This is only what we're reading. I think it's good that they're basically getting rid of generals. Generals aren't really something people want to use. You can still use them if you want by specializing a commander, but overall you can just completely ignore it as an option, as a UI element. And I think that's somewhat good. Getting rid of bloat is a good thing. Letting anybody run a planet could be interesting, but I will miss governors. It does feel somewhat weird now that we can have anybody 
run a planet, not just the not just the governors in our empire, having scientists, commanders, or or officials. That's going to be an interesting change. The devs are noting that you will still be able to override a sector governor on a specific planet by placing a planetary governor there. So your Forge Ecumenopolis could have an industrialist governor in a sector that is otherwise led by a scientist. I believe that could mean that if you have a sector governor now, the sector governor traits may affect the entire sector rather than it just being the level. Otherwise, this comment doesn't really make sense and would be completely irrelevant because at present, the traits of your governor on a sector only affect the planet they are on. It is their level bonuses that affect the entire sector. If it changes, that is going to be big news as well, as I think they may have kind of hinted at here. Finally, in this part, they are also doing a major rebalance to the traits themselves. But you can't do this to me. I just want to point out how unbelievably close I felt I was to finishing the leader tier list. We're currently here at one hour and basically 21 minutes of finish done. I've got a few um, a few tiers left to do. I mean, you know, we I, I've said. <laughs> I've started from the bottom up, and now for the uh, for the fourth time, I think we are going to be going. We're going to be going back back to formula and um, and restarting. Excellent, excellent. No worries, we can do it. We can do it. It's great. It's great. It's great. Let's go. You know how much I sacrificed. Why is it I need to go back to formula? Aren't they just going to be the same traits? Well, no, we're getting new traits in new uh, orientations. As part of this, they are reintroducing sector-wide traits to governors. So not all of the traits on the governors will be sector-wide, but certain specific traits will be if you have your governor on the sector capital. They are split across the governing veteran classes. That's across commander, um, the, the veteran classes that are in the official, and also the veteran class and scientist. The traits themselves will clearly show if they are of sector or planetary scope. Note that a sector-wide governor trait will not apply to a planet that has its own local planetary governor overriding them. Very interesting stuff. So are envoys real leaders now? That's a good question because it kind of sounds like they are. Well yes, but actually no. A single administrative leader can be assigned to your federation and another to the galactic community or empire like numerous envoys did in the past. Their level and traits will determine how effective they are at their job instead of cramming every envoy you can spare into those places. This makes delegates the optimal candidates for this sort of thing. This kind of means, I believe, in some ways, the biological supremacy in the galactic community is going to be at an end. It has been, for some time, much easier for regular biological empires to stack envoys in the diplomatic community when compared to hive minds and machine empires. For those empire types, it's actually much harder to get your hands on as many envoys. On top of that, this means when your crucial leader dies as a biological empire, all of your special diplo weight will be going away. This makes the immortal leaders of machines, I believe, more powerful than ever before. The Minister of State position is being added to the base council alongside the military and scientific ministries, so we will start with four councillors at the beginning of the game if we are a normal biological empire. This counselor will also have general effects on diplomacy, espionage, and first contact. We can see this counselor gives additional improve relation and harm relation effects, additional first contact discovery speed, and additional infiltration speed. Overall, this seems like the most useless counselor position of the four that we will now have, including our Empire ruler. We will be getting, though, four counselors at the start, which is definitely a buff to normal empires, and I am in favor of that. Envoys will remain as they were to represent the Minister of State's bureaucratic reach. So we will be getting some envoy leaders, but otherwise most of our envoys will not be leaders. They'll still be the regular envoys. They will handle minor tasks such as improve and harm relations, espionage spy networks, and first contact. 
However, by removing the need to put these in the galactic community, it frees up our envoys to do much more espionage and diplomatic improve or harm relations than ever before in Stellaris. It also kind of makes envoys pretty much useless, I'm feeling, but I'm not entirely sure yet. I guess if we've got 10 envoys and we can't stack them in the diplomatic community or in our federation, we're only really going to be using them for spy networks. And do we really need that is the next question I'm thinking and, and probably not given how underpowered espionage actions are at the moment. If we do get a full espionage rework by the custodians, that would be great. And this change could hint at an espionage rework being on the near horizon. And if that's the case, absolutely awesome. I can't wait to see it. What about leader caps, I hear you ask? Well, leader caps will be remaining, but they're now going to be per class. Remember, we only have three classes, so it's relatively easier to put harsher restrictions on each of them without overall restricting gameplay, I am imagining. Plus, given the fact that any leader can govern any planet or sector, that doesn't really uh, stop us having governors where we need them. With any overcap penalties, they will affect only the particular leader class that is over. Civics, traditions, and other effects that previously increased the generic leader cap will now generally increase the leader cap for one or more specific classes. The devs may end up shifting more of the overcap penalty onto the upkeep cost of leaders, I'm guessing, rather than the XP. However, if you are a feudal empire, you are going to completely ignore that. So, yikes, I suppose. Um, but yeah, they need to do something to fix this overpowered feudal nonsense that's currently going on. What about guest out councils? Well, guest out councils currently have a significant advantage in passing agendas in the early game due to having a larger number of councillors, as I mentioned previously. This disparity will be lessened a bit due to the regular empire starting with one additional councillor, and they're also making council legitimacy, how happy your factions are with your council, affect agenda progress. The nodes will get a little bit of a reshuffle to accommodate the various changes, but should otherwise remain generally familiar. The devs will be able to share more details later on during development cycles. So basically this makes normal biological empires closer in power to guest out early on. Yes, of course there is the overwhelming advantage of Progenitor Hive. They can get their nodes up stupidly quickly to high levels. They haven't done anything about that or they're not talking about doing anything to that right now. But later on in the game, aside from Progenitor Hive, I expect bio councils to be more powerful as you'll now have, I'm assuming, one extra maximum leader up to a total of seven councillors, that's one higher than the current six we have, as opposed to the five guest out councillor positions that are of course nodes and are unchanging. Modders will get more info about modding in the patch notes, but leader classes are no longer hard coded and thus much more moddable in script. So modders could theoretically be able to do things like this leader does research, commands armies, and represents us in the galactic community. The scope for modding with leaders is going to be absolutely massive from this point out. Is that everything? The answer is apparently no, there is still more to go through. Next up on the custodian, this is not internal politics agenda, is to unironically do a pass on council Agendas, I assume no pun intended. The thought here is that the agenda should have more impactful results, tangible effects rather than just empire modifiers. And the range of available agendas should be related to the ethics of your active counselors instead of the ethics of your empire. That could be quite an interesting rebalance. However, I think it would leave the uh, available agendas you have at the start of the game as a regular biological empire very much up to the whims of RNG. Who, who are your starting counselors? What do they believe? Whereas guest out empires will not be having that issue. This sounds to me like something that is a fun idea, but will end up being a direct nerf to bio empires who Basically, oh yeah, you don't get that agenda right at the start, sorry, because you don't have the right leader, you'll have to fire a leader and then hope that RN Jesus gives you the right ethic leader to put on your counter, which also has the right traits, etc, etc. 
More RNG, basically, if you're only giving it to one playstyle, will harm that playstyle when we compare it to a playstyle that does not have as much RNG in it. That, that's partially why Guest Out or Hive Mind is currently the most powerful build in Stellaris. This is planned to be in 3.11 redacted at the earliest, which I believe then that is the patch that should be coming out in quarter one of 2024. Crikey, 2024, time has really flown. In the longer term, the devs want to make gr a greater differentiation between the councils of different authorities. The councils of a democracy and a megacorp should feel different from one another. For example, I totally agree with that. That would be a great change to have because at the moment, it doesn't really matter aside from elections, whether you are a, a, an oligarchy, whether you're a democracy, whether you are whatever. Possibly democracies should elect from your leaders, even possibly your available leader pool, who will be on your council. And oligarchies you should be able to appoint. Possibly dictatorships should have some events that get triggered. Um, possibly there is a, a pseudo election or maybe just appointments. Empires, we're going closer to having maybe some more event style things with appointments. Maybe events where say one count. Next week, the devs are going to boldly go where no dev diary has gone before. I'm guessing this means we're going to be taking a look at the Star Trek reskin of Stellaris. I believe it's called Star Trek Infinite, not Stellaris Infinite. That's the name that I keep misremembering it as, but Star Trek Infinite where, um, and that looked good. We've seen the trailer for that. We've seen some dev diaries. Possibly we're going to be diving in and having a look at it in the dev diary for Stellaris. Though, if we do, I'd be a little confused because that game does have its own dev diaries and the Stellaris team is not the same team as is working on uh, Star Trek Infinite. That is an entirely different team. Any ideas what this comment means, please let me know down in the comments below. I, I'd love to hear from you because I, I'm a little confused where we're going to be going that's so boldly different. All right, at the beginning of this, I promised I would circle back to some thoughts on that initial opening uh, paragraph that we went through right at the start. What was discussed there was the fact that in Galactic Paragons, a lot of these changes coming in were outside the scope or they couldn't be done, etc, etc. Reading between the lines here a little bit and looking at the events surrounding the release of Galactic Paragons, uh, to remind uh, people, Galactic Paragons was not made by Paradox Green, the Stellaris team based in Stockholm focused on Stellaris, which is uh, owned and run by Paradox. That's a, a proper Paradox in-house team. It was made by uh, Paradox Arctic, which is up in Umeå, which is in the north of Sweden. Um, they were also involved in quite a few other DLCs and they were basically closed down, shipped out. I know some of the devs no longer now work at Paradox. They haven't, they haven't retained quite a bit of talent. Anyway, not getting into that specifically, but the DLC, in some ways, it's mentioned here, there are rough edges. It felt a little rushed. There were some bugs on release. Some of the balance has really not been there. And since the release of Galactic Paragons, it seems like the devs have been working a lot on balancing and rebalancing the leaders over and over and over. We, we basically had, I think, one in every three or four dev diaries the last the last five months since Galactic Paragons released in May has been about leaders, changing leaders in some way, balancing leader traits, rebalancing leader traits. I have been working, I have been working on a leader tier list now since it came out. I've gotten close a few times to finishing it. It's a monster. There's hundreds and hundreds of traits. There's a lot to talk about and I've not been able to put it out, quite frankly, because we keep getting leaders re balanced. I'm going to share with you now my thoughts on what I really think we need from a leader rebalance. First off, and I think most importantly, all of the traits which give a an upkeep or cost reduction modifier, that is the things like minus 10% ship build cost, minus 10% upkeep, minus 10% anything should be completely removed from the game. If we get a few reductions in cost or upkeep and we can get to say 20 or 30% from a few modifiers in the game, that's fine. That's not game breaking. 
but getting to minus 90% in uh, let's say living standards or, or housing or shipbuild cost or upkeep is really game breaking. It's leading to some crazy exploits and bugs. And I really feel all of those traits should be removed. We've already heard and we've already seen they're going to be removing all of the leader traits that simply grant us resources out of the ether. That is one massive way that Stellaris is completely broken and unbalanced at the moment. That is why if you watched my recent tournament, we were getting fleet powers of up to 1 million within, I think it was like 70 years of the game. Within 40 years, we had 150, 200,000, something like that. It was absolutely bonkers. This is partially based on the leaders. I think, yes, it's good to rebalance the leaders. Yes, there are some issues. The main issues I think here are balance based that we need to get rid of those, as I said, reductions in cost or upkeep. We need to get rid of the free resource traits and we should double down on the traits that provide a positive bonus. Increased ship build speed, increased experience, um, bonuses that can be stacked. And if we get to plus 100%, that's just double. That's not a tenfold anything. If we get to minus 90, let's not forget, that is a tenfold decrease in the cost of our ships. We get to minus 90% ship build cost. So that's, that's where I really feel the leader balance needs to be changed. Overall, apart from those issues, I'm actually pretty happy with where leaders are right now, ignoring the game breaking stuff, all right? This change, changing to commanders, officials, and scientists, I think could be interesting. I think it's going to get rid of some problems we had with not recruiting generals. Great, that sounds interesting. Overall, I don't think it's necessarily super needed, but it could be good to just finish things off here and consolidate. The main thing I'd actually like with leaders is for the devs to get to a point where they don't kind of overhaul in, in quite a big way the balance of leaders and what they're doing in the game. That's honestly where I'd like to get to. Maybe I'm being a bit selfish here because I just would like to finish a tier list and get to a point where I can publish it and it's valid for more than just six weeks because it's a large amount of work. But I don't know, let me know what you think down in the comments below because we've heard again and again about leader changes, balances, rebalances, re-rebalances, consolidations. Just let me know your thoughts. I'd love to hear them. Thank you if you're still listening to this ramble. We're now, I've got no idea where we're at actually. I think we're like well over 30 minutes now, including this rambling secret call out time. Woo! Let me know down in the comments if you've listened to all of this nonsense. Uh, we do need to also remember the devs here are doing a lot of great work. I don't want to at any point let anyone think that I um, I don't appreciate what the developers and what Paradox do for us with this custodian initiative and with games like Stellaris, like the Paradox DLC model, where we constantly are getting updates, we're constantly getting additional content for the game. This is an absolutely fantastic model. I really enjoy it. I'm just getting a bit fatigued with these constant changes to the same feature, that's all. If we were getting changes coming into a variety of different features over and over, like for example, getting this habitat rebalance, this habitat, if you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to find out more about the diplomacy rework where the devs are going to nerf vassal spam right into the ground, click the video on screen now.